next guest is uh, one of the best known up and coming hedge fund managers right now. He's been compared to Carl Icahn, Warren uh, Buffett, George Soros. Um, David Einhorn is president of Greenlight Capital, and it's fair to say that when uh, CFOs hear his name on the conference call, they, they break out in a sweat. Uh, today, we're not going to be talking specifically about that company, but about a bigger uh, objective, which is the um, actions of the Federal Reserve, and it's going to be a very interesting conversation. I'd like to wake, welcome uh, David Einhorn to Buttonwood. Thank you, David. Terrific. Um, David, in May you wrote a very provocative article for the Huffington Post, and just for the benefit of people folks here, I want to uh, read the uh, the first part of it. You said um, that you you a jelly donut is a yummy mid mid afternoon energy boost. Two jelly donuts are an indulgent breakfast. Three jelly donuts may induce a tummy ache. Six jelly donuts that's an eating disorder. <laughs> Twelve jelly donuts is a frat pledge hazing. Now. He actually wasn't talking about his position in Krispy Kreme. <laughs> he was talking about the Federal Reserve. So um, this is a, you, we're used to thinking that when the Fed eases monetary policy and promises low rates, that's a reason to buy the market. That's a bullish thing. But you take a very different point of view here. Explain to us why that is. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to tie it directly to the stock market or the financial markets, but I'm talking about the real economy. And, and if the, the point is, is sometimes you just have to go and look at what is the base assumption. Because sometimes you get a group think around a base assumption and everybody agrees the same thing and then acts reflexively and, and doesn't really challenge what's going on. And I think we've reached that point here with the monetary policy where the assumption is that if we want the economy to improve, if we want more jobs, if we want more consumption, what we need are ever easing uh, monetary policy. And my point is, is if one jelly donut is a fine thing to have, 35 jelly donuts is not a fine thing to have. And it gets to a point where it's not a question of a diminishing return, but it actually turns out to be a drag. And I think we're at the point right now, and we've long actually passed the point, where incremental easing of the federal policy actually acts as a headwind for the economy, and it's actually slowing down our recovery. And uh, I'm alarmed by sort of the, what I consider to be the, the reflexive groupthink of the leaders, which is if we want a stronger economy, we have to accommodate. We need lower rates. We need more quantitative easing and, and other uh, such measures. So the, uh, the reason that the central bankers in their textbooks say they should lower interest rates is because in a classical model, lower interest rates basically make it less attractive to save, more attractive to consume today. That gets consumption up, the economy starts going again. What is wrong with that textbook model in your view? I think there's a couple of things. I think first of all, I think the lower rates drive up the cost of commodities. They drive up the cost of oil, it drives up the cost of food. And money that's spent on oil is sent out of the country you know, to the Mideast and stuff like that, and it doesn't help anything else, and it takes income out of people's pockets that they could otherwise spend on other goods. And the, the same is true of, of, of commodities in general. The second is that it, it's causing, not being able to earn a safe return on, on savings is causing people to hoard savings rather than consume. In other words, if I know I'm going to earn 3% in the bank, I can spend that income and I can have visibility towards that. But if I know I'm going to earn zero in the bank, in order to figure out how much I need to save for retirement, I need to save a much bigger number, which means I can't spend much now. I have to save more now to build up those savings for, for retirement. And if I've already retired and I'm on a fixed income, my income has now really gone down. And I have to hoard money so that I can spread it out thinner over the longer part of my life. So by denying individuals savings uh, or, or interest on income on their savings, um, it, it's causing sort of a, a hoarding of that, and it's driving down consumption, which is, which is hurting the economy. At least that, that's my judgment. Um, so you look at a lower interest rate, and clearly that deprives savers of some income. But on the other side of the coin, presumably that's saving borrowers some money, and they could go out and spend that money. What breaks down in that relationship? Well, there's a, a multiplier. Because first of all, the, the part about commodities and stuff like that, that's just true. And there's, there's the, the, I guess the, 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 maybe there's less money in Saudi Arabia or something like that. And I don't think that, that are, there's any negative trade-off to the American economy of you know, importing less oil or paying less for the oil that we do import. 
um, you know, in terms of the savings, I don't think it's a zero sum because it's a multiplier on the behavior. It's not just the income I'm not receiving now, it's the income I don't expect to receive in the future as well. So when they lower rates to zero in the middle of the crisis in 2008, there's not necessarily a permanent impact on savers. But now we're four years into that policy with a promise of at least three more. So that's seven years. And so what you're getting is, is, a, is a change in behavior on a multiplied basis. Um, so um, I've been following uh, Fed policy for a while, and I always uh, like to hear the views of the economists and views of the traders. And usually they're uh, in sync. But this is actually a period when I'm very um, nervous because most of the economists feel the Fed's doing the right thing, but a lot of the traders, and you very eloquently have <laughs> laid the case out here, feel the opposite. Uh, ex from your point of view, what explains this gap? What is it that you and other traders who feel this way, and, and, and I know you speak to a lot of people who, uh, who agree, what is it that you see that you think the central bankers and the economists are missing? I, I think it's the basic assumption, because you, you can start with the view that lower rates generally stimulate the economy, which in most environments is plainly true. You know, if rates are 8% and you make them 6%, you're going to have a stimulative effect on the economy. And so there's lots of regressions and other math games that you can play that lead you to think that lower rates stimulate the economy. But I equate that to sort of like the first jelly donut in the, um, in the analogy. The problem is, is these models don't tell you when, the, I guess the economists would concede that right now we have diminishing returns. And so what you'd need to do is more and more to get the same effect. And what I actually think is, is, is you've gone past the point of a diminishing return is, is that you actually have like a, a negative return and it's actually, it's actually harming us. And it's very hard for economists with models with very limited sample sets and empirical data to understand this. So I think that you wind up with a different view from people like me who are sort of in the real world who aren't just trying to figure out, well, you know, what do the models say, but how do people actually behave? You know, who out there isn't buying a house today because rates are too high? I can't think of anybody. What companies are deciding not to build factories because rates are too high? There's, there's nobody. So there's, there's not demand that's being held down because rates are too high. The, on the other hand, you look and say, well, what are the risks that are being created by these policies? And there's between the fiscal policy and the monetary policy, we've opened up enormous tail risks of, well, what happens if the Fed loses control or what happens if the Treasury loses control? And these scare people and actually drive up risk premiums and drive down PE multiples and, and make people like companies defer long-term investments in the country because they're worried about uh, significant tail risks that these uh, very aggressive policies are creating. Um, I was at a press conference that uh, Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, gave um, a month or so ago to explain the new policy. Um, he didn't mention your name, but uh, it, uh, Good thing. Uh, it, it, it is entirely possible that he, he at one point read your article. He said the following. He wanted to, he directly addressed the specific issue. He said he's aware that uh, lower interest rates do deprive savers of some in income. But they went on to say the following. Low interest rates also support the value of many other assets that Americans own, such as homes and businesses, large and small. Um, uh, indeed, healthy investment returns cannot be sustained in a weak economy. And of course, it is difficult to save for retirement or other goals without the income from a job. Right. What's your, what are your thoughts on, on what he said there? Well, there's two problems with what he's saying. The first is, is he's assuming what he's trying to prove. In other words, he's assuming that his low rate policy is actually making a strong economy. And then he says, therefore, we benefit from the strong economy and it overwhelms the heart of the savers. But if you take the premise the other way and think that the accommodative policy is actually slowing down the economy, well, then his policy isn't creating an offsetting positive benefit. The second problem with what he's saying is, is he's talking about the benefits of asset values, stock values, and housing values, and so forth. And my problem with this is twofold. Number one, we just went through 15 years where I think we really learned that a policy of trying to create income by creating asset bubbles has bad consequences when those bubbles eventually unwind. So it's very unclear why we would want to do that again. And second, there's no underlying analysis where he compares the benefit, he thinks, of the so-called wealth effect 
versus the harm of the lost income from the savers and weighs those two things against each other to conclude, yes, the savers are being hurt, but it's being overwhelmed by the wealth effect. I actually think if one took the time to really look at the data as best they could, uh, I think you'd come to the opposite conclusion. So you, if I understand your argument correctly, you think that an increase in interest rates right now might actually help the economy and reverse some of the damage that you're talking about, right? I think that's true with the caveat that to change policy would require a very, very careful messaging because there's a lot of very levered players at the core of the financial system which have huge, huge bets on the Fed doing what it has promised to do. So it's not like something that it would make sense to abruptly change overnight you know, boom, interest rates are now 2.5% because I think you'd have some derivatives books and stuff like that that would probably blow up. So I, I think that, the, that to do a transition, it would, it would require, you know, some careful um, messaging as to how that transition went. But setting that aspect aside, I think you would, if we want more jobs and we want more consumption and we want to have the economy grow at a faster rate, we would be way better off if we did the, pretty much the opposite of the current monetary policy. Historians say that's what the Fed did in 1937. After a period of uh, interest rates near zero, there were some concerns about inflation, so the Fed moved towards a tighter stance, and the economy promptly collapsed. It was later called the depression within a depression. Should that give us a sense of caution about pursuing that? Uh, you know, I, I'm not, scenario? look, I'm not uh, as, um, you know, perfectly knowledgeable of what was going on in 1937, but I don't believe that they were engaged on the monetary policy with policies anywhere near as extreme and aggressive uh, going into that as they are right now. And so I don't know that the whatever the low rates of the time were, were creating uh, the kinds of tail risks that are being created right now. Uh, I'd like to have some questions now. Um, we have some microphones in the audience with the usual proviso that um, if you have a, do have a question, please give us your name. Um, do we have any hands up there? Um, there's a, a question right up there uh, in the front. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Pierre Collard, I'm an, an economist. Uh, you focused a lot on monetary policy uh, to uh, stress that uh, current monetary easing might be ineffective in the current environment. Um, my concern is rather that to, to get out of a crisis, uh, focusing, I mean, using only monetary policy. Uh, and uh, getting uh, rid of fiscal of any fiscal stimulus uh, might be uh, more the cause of uh, the current situation. Uh, how would you? I mean, if I have to to formulate a question, sorry, I would say, um, what, in your assessment, is the absence of a of a real fiscal policy? Uh, how, how does this contribute to uh, the, the current uh, low growth situation? Thank you. Yeah, I think the fiscal policy is compounding the monetary policy problem. For example, I think it's limiting the authority's ability to react to whatever the next crisis is. So for example, let's just say that it turns out that eventually we wind up with an inflation and, and, and the Fed wants to fight the inflation. Well, what they've said before is, is well, we, we know what to do to fight inflation. We could raise the rate that we pay on the reserves, or we could raise the Fed funds rates and, and sort of cut off the inflation that way. And that's what, what Volcker did you know, a, a number of years ago. But the problem is, is if you really had to raise rates, when, when Volcker did it, the debt to GDP was about 35 or 40 percent. So you had the flexibility. If you needed to take rates up to 15% to fight in inflation for a while, you could actually do that. But if you actually start, and, and some of the debt at that point was financed on a much longer term basis. Right now, we have very, very short term financing, both because the Treasury is very short, and not only that, the Fed has bought up most of the long duration Treasury debt. So if you look at the government consolidated between those, the financing is very, very short. So if you had to raise rates, forget to 15%, if you had to raise it to the high single digits or something, you'd wind up with an enormous fiscal problem immediately. So they don't have the ability to unwind what they're doing the, the way that um, they think they are without causing. Uh, and a furthering of the crisis. Uh, another question? Uh, was there another question up there? Yeah. 
Hi, um, I'm Dr. Singh. I'm a private practitioner um, and an educator at a, at a major university hospital. So this is, this is a question that's directed from a very different standpoint than what you've been asked in the past. Now, I completely understand you've been talking about on a macro scale, on a scale that's too large for a private practitioner to understand. What I'm going to try to do is try to scale it down to a very small scale. Most, um, almost everyone understands and accepts the fact that, uh, that uh, employment is going to increase by small business. As a small business owner, I find that growing is becoming extremely challenging. Um, the cost of borrowing money from our standpoint, from a small scale standpoint, is cost prohibitive. Banks who have a huge safety net can borrow money at zero interest. We cannot. We can't expand like banks can. So why is it that when we go out to look for money, the lending institutions charge a huge premium, almost preventing us from growing. What's it, what kind of, uh, what can you tell us? We'll go to uh, a, uh, sorry, we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to see if you, you can uh, answer that. Um, I, look, I think when you look at the surveys of small business owners, you know, I think the survey data says that most of them are getting their finances, finance is met. So I can't speak to anybody's individual circumstance or what their credit history is or what their, their type of business is. But I think right now, at least, there is a reasonable amount of availability, for, uh, of maybe not of venture capital, but of, um, of lending for established or establishing small businesses. Uh, startups are probably another matter because a, a lot of that has been kind of squeezed out of the market because the, the banks are, they're not short of reserves or funds, what they're short of is, is, is capital. They need much more capital to take on the risk and we haven't really fully recapitalized the, the banks from the last crisis so they're kind of averse to the riskier parts of the, um, the lending curve. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Way too short, unfortunately. Um, but David, thanks very much for coming. A very provocative uh, discussion. Um, Thank you. All right. And uh, we're going to go to lunch now. It'll be upstairs in the same place where we had the uh, reception yesterday. Thank you very much. <laughs>